Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 278, The Inquisition and the Reformation. It's likely, if not certain, that the Inquisition would have led a much more sheltered existence had it not been for one thing, the Reformation. Suddenly, there was heresy, real heresy, a lot of heresy, at least from the perspective of the Roman Catholic Church. The Church, I guess really for the first time ever, or at least for the first time in about 1,200 years, found itself on the defensive. Anything that was not strictly orthodoxy had to go. Heresy had to be exercised from the land, root and branch. For example, there was a movement in 15th century Spain that emphasized a passive union between God and the soul. The method was known as abandonment, but this highly mystical movement was much more often referred to as Illuminism and its followers, Illuminists. Absent the Reformation and Martin Luther, this movement probably just escapes the notice of Rome. And it did for a long time. No one cared. But with everything and everyone on high alert, the Inquisition stepped in and completely eviscerated the Illuminists in 1524. I mentioned this during the Galileo episodes, but it is worth remembering that the Reformation impacted all of Europe, whether or not there were any Protestants in said kingdom. The elimination of the Illuminists is a great example of this phenomenon. Oh, and by the way, nearly every person charged with heresy in the Illuminist controversy was a converso. To be clear, there had been nothing remotely Jewish about the Illuminist movement, which is interesting, because stamping out secret Judaism was ostensibly what the Inquisitors were supposed to do. The threat it seemed, had changed. The threat was now Lutheranism. As a result, one of Europe's leading intellectuals found his works under increasing scrutiny in Spain, Erasmus. His last surviving letter directed to the Spanish was in 1533. He died three years later. While never expressly banned, Erasmusism was looked upon with suspicion by the Spanish Inquisition. To many, his movement and his ideas smacked too much of Protestantism to be tolerated. This Lutheran threat, however, took a long time to develop. In 1520, Luther had probably never been heard of in Spain. Lutheran books were first sent to the peninsula with what result we do not know by Luther's publisher in 1519. The first Spaniards to come into contact with his teachings were those who accompanied the emperor to Germany. Some of them, seeing him only as a reformer, were actually favorable to his ideas. However, a full generation went by, and Lutheranism failed to take root in Spain. There was, in those years, no atmosphere of restriction or repression. Before 1558, possibly less than 50 cases of alleged Lutheranism among Spaniards came to the notice of the Inquisitors. In most of them, it's difficult to identify specifically Protestant beliefs. There was some curiosity about the heresies that Luther was propounding, but there was little sign that anyone took an active interest in his notions. What explanation can be offered for this astonishing inability of Protestant ideas to ever come to Spain? With its unreformed church, a somewhat backward clergy, and a decidedly medieval institution, i.e. the Inquisition, in full force, Spain should have been ripe for conquest by the Reformation. But in one major respect, Spain was peculiarly unfertile ground. Unlike England, France, and Germany, Spain had not since the early Middle Ages experienced a single popular heresy. All its ideological struggles since the Reconquest had been directed against the minority religions, Judaism and Islam. 
there was consequently no native heresy, like the followers of John Wycliffe in England, on which German ideas could be built. Moreover, Spain was the only European country to possess a national institution, the Inquisition, dedicated to the elimination of heresy. Because of its vigilance and by coordinating its efforts throughout the peninsula, it's possible that the Inquisition checked the seeds of heresy, Lutheranism, before they could be sown. In the 1540s, possibly the only Spanish intellectuals to come directly into contact with Lutheranism were those in foreign universities. Certainly among the peasant class, Spaniards would occasionally come into contact with immigrant workers from some place like France or perhaps the Netherlands, who had direct contact with these new beliefs. But it seems that ideas transmitted at this level were either confused, disordered, or just frankly unlikely to strike root anywhere. But to Charles V, who by the middle of the century was living in retirement, the threat was real. In May 1558, he wrote a scathing letter to Juana, his daughter and regent in the absence of Philip II in the Netherlands, that the only answer to the Protestant menace was repression. I think the letter speaks for itself. Quote, I am very satisfied with what you have written to the king, informing him of what is happening about the people imprisoned as Lutherans, more of whom are being daily discovered. But believe me, my daughter, this business has caused and still causes me more anxiety and pain than I can express. For while the king and I were abroad, these realms remained in perfect peace, free from calamity. But now that I have returned here to rest and recuperate and serve our Lord, this great outrage and treachery implicating such notable persons occurs in my presence and in yours. You know that because of this I suffered and I went through great trials and expenses in Germany and lost so much of my good health. Were it not for the conviction I have that you and members of your councils will find a radical cure to this unfortunate situation, punishing the guilty throughout to spreading and prevent it. I do not know whether I could restrain myself leaving here to settle the matter. Since this affair is more important for the service of our Lord and the good and preservation of these realms than any other, and since it is only in its beginnings with such small forces that they can easily be put down, it is necessary to place the greatest strength and weight on a quick remedy and exemplary punishment. I do not know whether it will be enough in these cases to follow the usual practice, by which, according to common law, all those who beg for mercy and have their confession accepted are pardoned with a light penance if it is a first offense. Such people, if set free, are at liberty to commit the same offense, particularly if they are educated persons. One can imagine the evil consequences, for it is clear they cannot act without armed organization and leaders, and so it must be seen whether they can be proceeded against as creators of sedition, upheaval, riots, and disturbance in the state. They would then be guilty of rebellion and could not expect any mercy. In this connection, I cannot omit to mention what was and is the custom in Flanders. I wanted to introduce the Inquisition to punish the heresies that some people had caught from neighboring Germany and England, and even France. Everyone opposed this on the grounds that there were no Jews among them. Finally, an order was issued, declaring that all people of whatever state and condition who came under certain specified categories were to be ipso facto burnt and their goods confiscated. Necessity obliged me to act in this way. I do not know what the king my son has done since then, but I think that the same reason will have made him continue as I did, because I advised and begged him to be very severe in dealing with these people. Believe me, my daughter, if so great an evil is not suppressed and remedied without distinction of persons from the very beginning, I cannot promise that the king or anyone else will be in a position to do it afterwards. End quote. This letter marks a turning point in Spanish history, and frankly, a turning point when we're talking about the relationship between governments and religion. 
Thanks to the fear Charles expressed, anything outside 100% Catholic orthodoxy was to be considered a dire threat and must be destroyed. Charles just poured gasoline on the fires of the Inquisition. And the effect was rather immediate. In 1562 alone, the Inquisition pursued 88 cases against Protestants or alleged Protestants. Of these, 18 were burned. A whopping 20.4% of those charged. I suppose the proof was in the pudding, though, from the Inquisition's perspective. With those burnings, Protestantism was almost completely extinguished in Spain. The 1562 burnings also instilled within the Spanish population a tremendous fear of Lutherans. They saw Lutherans everywhere, and they were not shy about coming forward with accusations against their neighbors, especially if they were cavalier enough to make anti-clerical statements. Now, they needn't be, of course. By the late 1560s, neither Judaism nor Protestantism was much of a threat in Spain. Somewhat ironically, I suppose, less people died in Spain as a result of religious conflict in those years than elsewhere in Europe. The Spanish Inquisition condemned to die just under 100 people between 1559 and 1566. And of those, remember, 18 died in 1562. Bloody Mary executed three times that number in England. Henry II, twice as many in France. And in the Netherlands, over 10 times that number would die. So, oddly, I guess, the Inquisition worked. Though the real answer was probably that Spanish society was simply more insular at this point than elsewhere in Europe. There were just less Protestants to begin with. Protestantism never developed in Spain. There were Spanish Protestants, of course, but most emigrated. You could find pockets of Spanish Protestants dotted throughout Europe. There just weren't any in Spain, at least none that we know of, of course, there must have been some, we just don't know about them. The real brunt of the attack of so-called Lutheranism was borne by foreign visitors, like traders and sailors, and by foreign residents in Spain. The heresy scare intensified xenophobia among many sections of the population, and it made Spain, at least for a time, unsafe for foreigners. The Holy Office had been active against foreigners from as early as 1530. Spain's extensive trade with Northern Europe made contact with outsiders inevitable, especially in the ports. The first Protestant foreigner to be burnt by the Inquisition was young John Tack, an Englishman of Flemish origin. He was burnt in Bilbao in May of 1539. Up until 1560, nine other foreigners were arrested and, quote-unquote, reconciled by the Inquisitioners. Throughout its existence, the Spanish Inquisition remained almost inherently racist and xenophobic. It once pointed the finger exclusively at the Moor, then at the Jew, then at the Converso, and finally at the foreign Protestant. Though again, of course, I hate to keep pointing this out, but this was mainly in Castile. Even in Aragon, most of the Inquisitors were Castilian, and there they tended to treat even the native Aragonese with suspicion, especially those from Catalan or the Basque region. Now, the failure of the Protestant cause in the Mediterranean inevitably raises the question of why no Reformation occurred in Spain. Efficiency of repression can't be the only answer. Of course, Repression was, as we'll see, more efficient and more brutal in some other countries, notably the Netherlands. But the persecution there didn't end the Reformation. Now, Philip II was convinced that it was timely repression and continuous vigilance that kept the Inquisition in check. Consider what he wrote in 1569. Quote, Had there been no Inquisition, there would be many more heretics and the country would be much more afflicted as are those where there is no Inquisition, as in Spain, end quote. Perhaps this is what the Spanish king believed. 
but historians don't think it's true. Nor is there any possibility to maintain that Spain was simply sealed off from heresy, a sort of fortress Spain. The outdated image of an iron curtain or a great firewall of China back in the 16th century, of the Inquisition descending on the country and cutting it off from the rest of the world, simply bears no relation to reality. In the 1560s and 1550s, very many Spaniards were traveling abroad, more Spaniards than ever before published, and most of them their books in foreign areas. Tens of thousands, mainly Castilians, served overseas in the army, where they often rubbed shoulders with people of other faiths. The land frontier in the Pyrenees was occasionally watched, sometimes because of the danger of military intervention by the French, but it was never, and it could never be closed. Indeed, there was never any Great Wall, nor ever even any Hadrian's Wall across the Pyrenees. Throughout the late 16th century, Spaniards drifted at will over the frontier. Some went to trade, some to be educated, some even wanted to join the Calvinists in Geneva. At the same time, many foreigners, principally artisans, came to Spain. It was a handful of these men, through careless actions often on their part, again, criticizing the clergy in the open, who fell into the hands of the Inquisition. Now, the difficulty in controlling the Pyrenees frontier, which was Spain's chief overland link with the outside world, comes through in the anxious correspondence of the ambassador to France in the 1560s, a man by the name of Francis de Alba. In 1564 and 1565, he sent reports to the king about booksellers in Saragossa, men who had come to Léon and Toulouse to purchase books on law and philosophy and then take them home. In one of the cases, he said the bookseller had links to Geneva. This importation of foreign books, as we may observe, was carried out in contravention of the laws of Castile. Alva also confirmed that, quote, many books, catechisms, and psalters in Basque had passed through Toulouse to Spain, end quote. I suppose somewhat ironically, de Alva was a Basque, so he understood what he was talking about. Books in Catalan, he also reported, had been taken into Catalonia, and other heretical books had gone to Pamplona. In those same weeks, the Archbishop of Bordeaux forwarded a report on a citizen of Burgos who had, quote, taken four or five loads of heretical books in Spanish and in Latin through the mountains of Yaca, end quote. Despite the open frontier, heresy failed to penetrate at all. The Reformation, in the end, for Spaniards, remained a phenomenon that did not affect them. For the balance of today's show, I want to talk about the Inquisition and its relationship to the arts and sciences. Obviously, the latter has a lot of relevance when it comes to Galileo. Now, early on, there's some evidence of major book confiscations throughout Spain, especially in a place like Salamanca. Clearly, Hebrew books were off limits and would be seized by the Inquisition. The Inquisitors also seem to have frowned on magic and astrology, though it's not clear why. But it was the printing press, again, I know, again, that really changed the game. Quickly, the church, and especially the Inquisition, realized it had to be involved with the printing process, given the changes in scale. You could just produce so many more books, so much quicker. And this was new. The advent of the printing press brought the invention of pre-publication censorship. It just didn't exist in Europe prior to that invention. It didn't need to. The Council of Trent gave bishops the right to oversee book production starting in 1564. But by then, the various European states were already deeply invested in the policy of censorship. England passed censorship laws in 1538, and throughout Italy, censorship had become a mainstay by the end of the 1540s. Now, technically, the institution itself of the Inquisition 
had no power to license or prevent the licensing of books. Everything it did was through other institutions. But it was very aggressive in coming after books with which it disagreed. Now, generally, in what I meant there, we're really talking about post-publication. Starting in the 1530s and 1540s, the Inquisition attempted to stop the entry of heretical literature into the peninsula. And I hope it goes without saying, but every time I say the word heretical literature throughout the rest of this episode, I mean subjectively from the perspective of the Inquisition. As the only Spanish tribunal with authority over all of Spain, it was able to act in areas like seaports where state officials could not. The government took no direct initiative over controlling literature until the shock discovery of multiple Protestants in Spain in 1558. That event stung the regent Juana, because Charles was absent, into action. On the 7th of September 1558, she issued a radical decree of control. The law banned the introduction into Castile of all books printed in other realms in Spanish, obliged printers to seek licenses from the Council of Castile, and laid down a strict procedure for the operation of censorship. Contravention of any of these points would be punished by death and confiscation, not that you would care about the latter given the former. At the same time, the Inquisition was allowed to issue licenses when printing for its own purposes. According to the new rules, manuscripts were to be checked and censored both before and after publication, and all booksellers were to keep by them a copy of the Index of Prohibited Books. So wide-ranging was the Decree of 1558 that it remained theoretically in force until the 19th century. Now, Philip was in Brussels, Philip the King of Spain, from which he wrote approvingly about all these measures taken by his sister. Heresy was spreading, he said, throughout the European universities. And so, as a consequence, just before returning to Spain, the king banned the Netherlands subjects from studying in France. When he arrived in the peninsula in 1559, he issued an order on the 22nd of November to all subjects of the crown of Castile, studying abroad, or teaching abroad, that they must return within four months. Of course, there were a few chinks in the armor of this censorship, and it's really almost idea censorship legislation. First, it only impacted Castilians. Philip could just order the legislation to be carried out in Castile, but to do so in Aragon, he would need to summon the Cortes, which he refused to do. So the entire eastern half of the Iberian Peninsula was exempt from all of these laws. Second, control over imports again applied to Castile and Castile alone. Outside Castile, the government had to rely solely on the Inquisition and the methods within its disposal to oversee the book trade. Third, the fact of the matter remained that even in the 16th century, Spain had virtually no printing industry of its own. It relied almost exclusively on foreign imports for books. Hence, the Spanish government had a lot less control over book printing because no books were actually being printed in Spain. In reality, as you can probably tell, all of these laws amount to little bit more than a trade embargo. But of course, the biggest problem was enforcement. Most Spaniards simply ignored the law. It was an easy law to get around, especially because it had a huge loophole. It did not cover reprints. So if you wanted to import a banned book, all you had to do was brand it as a reprint, and it was exempt from censorship laws. So you could make substantial changes to a book, call it a reprint, and you were good. Imagine this. You could have a 16th century cookbook that's been approved, and then you just 
stuff Protestant literature into it, call it a reprint, and you get exempted. You can see why this didn't work. And in the end, of course, it didn't. Throughout Europe, the Reformation generated both hopes and fears, ushering in a period of precaution. One of the biggest changes the Reformation brought was the end of academic unity. The old idea of an international pan-European community of men of letters simply melted away. Academics now never left their home countries. And what was tolerated varied dramatically from kingdom to kingdom. Institutions began to give classes in the vernacular now rather than Latin because there was no need for a universal language. The frontiers, of course, between France and Spain, in reality never really closed, given that Castilians were the only ones ever subject to these new restrictions. Hence, in the late 1540s, a veritable storm of unlicensed Bibles flooded into Spain. Between 1551 and 1552, the Inquisition finally stepped in, and it tried to crack down on these unlicensed publications, and the sheer scale of what they found proved how pointless the endeavor was. In Seville alone, the Inquisitors rounded up 450 illegal volumes, and clearly this was a tip-of-the-iceberg situation. Exasperated, the Inquisition simply issued a blanket prohibition of 65 unlicensed editions in 1554. Once again, the evidence suggests this did nothing to stem the tide of new Bibles. And censorship encouraged a practice which soon became common, the burning of books. Book burning was not new. Emperor Constantine had burned all Arian books that he could find in the 4th century CE. The medieval Inquisition had followed suit. In the 16th century, the practice of book burning was common in both France and Italy. In 1561, an inquisitor wrote a letter asking what to do with all the books that he had rounded up. There were many books of ours, he said, which could be easily corrected and resold. But the Inquisition replied, quote, Burn them. And what of the Bibles? Burn them. And the books of medicine? Many with superstitious materials? Burn them. End quote. This drastic solution, luckily, was not always applied. As I mentioned, the flow of books was impossible to stop completely, since Spain depended on imports for much of its literature. Quote, from one hour to the next, books keep arriving from Germany, end quote, commented the Inquisition in 1532. Its officials were ordered to keep watch at seaports. Special attention was paid to the Basque coast. In 1553, for perhaps the first time, detailed instructions were issued to inquisitors about how to carry out visits to foreign ships and Spanish ports. But few heretical books were ever found. The real victims of the vigilance were the booksellers. From 1559, when a shipment of 3,000 books destined for Alcala was seized on a French vessel in San Sebastian, booksellers in Spain had to put up with wholesale embargoes of their imports. In general, the shipments were neither confiscated nor censored. They were simply delayed until the bureaucracy had decided that no illegal imports were taking place. In 1564, the Inquisition ordered its officials in Bilbao and San Sebastian to send on to booksellers in Medina 245 bales of books imported from Leon. Three years later, those books hadn't moved. They were still in their ports. Hence, the impact on Spaniards on the ability to acquire literature and books was dramatic, while the impact on heretical literature was negligible to nil. The greatest damage of all in any system of censorship or this one was suffered by the book itself. Some books probably disappeared altogether, and not exclusively through the fault of the Inquisition. A report drawn up for them at the end of the 16th century says that, quote, many to avoid taking their books to the Inquisitors burn not only those prohibited and to be expurged, 
but even those that are approved and harmless, or else get rid of them or sell them for a pittance. In this way, an infinite number are neither examined nor corrected, but are eventually lost to nobody's advantage. For their owners suffer the great losses, and what is more important, a great many books disappear. End quote. And this brings us to one of the myths of the Inquisition, that it set out to crush intellectuals. Sure, it was inevitable that an independent-minded thinker and a body designed to ensure a unitary system of thought would have conflict, as it's going to with Galileo. But those conflicts were surprisingly few and far between. And I have to admit, after reviewing all the evidence on the Inquisition, by and large, science wasn't its target. Protestantism was. Now, in part, the lack of conflict was because writers simply steered clear of the Inquisition, while its Inquisition tried to deal sensibly with most authors. As we're going to see with Galileo, he met multiple times with different officials and had every opportunity to publish his book from their perspective the correct way. He simply didn't. And so in that way, Galileo is very much an exception to the rule. There are two distinct opinions about the impact of the Inquisition on literature. One, strongly supported by traditionalists, denies any negative influence at all. Historian Menendez de Pelo asserted that, quote, never was there more written in Spain or better written than in the two golden centuries of the Inquisition, end quote. The other, reflected in many modern studies, claims that the Spaniards virtually ceased to write and think. Another historian argued, quote, It would seem superfluous to insist that a system of severe repression of thought by all the instrumentalities of the Inquisition and state is an ample explanation for the decadence of Spanish learning and literature, end quote. For the English Catholic historian, Lord Acton, the injury inflicted on literature by the Inquisition, quote, was the most obvious and conspicuous fact of modern history, end quote. Another historian put it rather succinctly that, quote, not to think or learn or read became habitual for Spaniards, faced by the sadism and lust for plunder of those of the holy office, end quote. These, of course, are extreme views, and the evidence doesn't support either one of them. Both assume, of course, that censorship functioned effectively in Spain, which it didn't. One view claims it worked for the better, purging heresy, the other that it worked for the worse, suppressing creativity. In reality, it did neither. It simply wasn't effective or efficient enough to do so in the early modern period. Next time, we start to take a look at the Inquisition itself. How did it function? What were its systems like? And that will allow us to segue back to Galileo and his infamous trial. As always, if you'd like more content, check out the links in the show notes. I've got a link to the website there. I've got a link to all kinds of free trials of Patreon pages and Western Civ 2.0, all kinds of good stuff, which is there for the taking, if you so choose. <laughs>